right. Hello, everybody. Hey, everybody, thank you for coming out. I'm glad that you took the time to invest in your relationship with God and, and in your relationship with your spouse by being here tonight. Um, Lord, I pray that you'd bless everyone who's here tonight and you'd use this night for your glory, God. We know that your word doesn't return void, that it, it accomplishes things in our lives. So I, I pray, God, that our hearts would be open, our minds, that we would be receptive, Lord, to what we could learn tonight and that it would bless our marriages, bless our followership of you. Um, so, Lord, we welcome you. We welcome your Holy Spirit to work and move in our midst. I pray for all the speakers tonight that you'd bless them in the words that they would share and empower them, God. Empower them to have, for those words to have their way in our lives. So we welcome you. We welcome you this evening, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Rekindling marriage. Marriage rekindling. So glad that you're here. Uh, I'm thankful that I was married in December of 95 to my bride Kelly who's here in the back row there. Hello, Kelly. And uh, I'm thankful that God has been at the center of our marriage since 10 months into it. We came to know the Lord 10 months after we got married. And uh, that has been amazing for our marriage and for our family to have the Lord strengthen us and help us throughout the journey. Hey, we have several different people who are going to speak tonight, and I'm going to speak or interject a little bit as we go. And I'm going to start off with just a short word from Ephesians 5.21. And you're, you're probably familiar with the passage where, you know, you hear about wives submitting to your husbands, and, and a lot of times that's kind of what we focus on. And I have so much I could say about that that I'm not going to say right now. But how that entire passage begins, and I'm reading from the Legacy Standard Version, but Ephesians 5.21, and, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then it goes on to talk about wives and husbands and husbands and wives for the rest of the passage. But it starts off in being submissive to or subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Of Christ, that that word there, subject or submit, means also to yield, to yield one one's admonition, to to yield to another, and then to another, and then it says out of the fear. So the word there actually is is phobia, so it, it's accurately translated fear, but it's really more than that. It, it it's it's a combination of fear, reverence respect and honor. And we're talking about our relationship with Jesus here. It says, and being submissive to one another in the fear, reverence, honor, respect of Jesus. And I just want to start by saying that, you know, I think the number one thing that would bless our marriages and will bless our marriages moving forward is that we revere Jesus Christ. That we love him, we want to honor him, we want to obey him, we want our marriages to, to reflect the fact that we are believers in Jesus Christ. And I can't think of anything that will help us more than that. That as we're going through this journey of faith with our wives and we go through challenges and we go through struggles, that we would revere the Lord, that we would say, Lord, I want to do right by you. I want to honor you in my life. I want to, in my own personal behavior, God, I want to, I have a fear, an awe, a respect, a reverence for you. I want to honor you. And in my marriage, Lord, what do you want me to change? How do you want me to be? What can I do to honor you? God, strengthen me. Help me to see. Help me to, to discern, Lord, what you would want me to do in order to honor you in my marriage. And he will. That's the thing. He will, right? He will give us the advice we need. He will give us the guidance we need to be better husbands, to be better wives. And if there's anything that, that I would leave you with today, and I have more to share later, it's just that you would say, God, I want to honor you in my life and in my marriage. And when you do that, you'll be blessed. You really will. God will help 
us. Amen? Uh, even this week, uh, and I'm probably getting ahead to what... I, I'm going to share this now, and it won't take long, but we, we were going through something as a family. You know, we, we all, all of us had challenges, right? You know, and, and we have challenges in our own family that, that we're dealing with, and sometimes it's hard. It, it's stuff that, you know, you have to really work hard to come to agreement on. You know, maybe your first um, perception or the way that you think about something is different than your spouse. And, and, and at first that puts you kind of at odds with one another. And I would say that we, we were at one of those junctures, kind of funny, coming into a marriage retreat, you know. And here my wife and I are, are kind of on a different side of things a little bit. On the same side, but yet we're leaning a little bit different on it and have to figure out how we're going to address these things. And I just thought it was so cool because I woke up and after this happened and I was in my chair reading my Bible and seeking God and my wife was going for a walk. Sometimes we do that together, but she went out for a walk by herself. And uh, so I'm still sitting there reading and, and pondering and, you know, studying God. And she comes back from a walk with God and she's like, honey, I want to talk to you. You know, and she's like, I don't want to fight with you. I you know, I understand, like, where you're coming from, and, like, we were able to really easily come to agreement and be able to understand one another and reconcile with each other on the thing that we were dealing with, but why? Because <laughs> she went to the Lord, right? And because I was sitting before the Lord, and God brings perspective. And so many times when there's conflict in our marriages, man, we can't we can't seek to try to sort that out in our flesh, in our own way of thinking. We really need to have God's perspective. He can bring harmony. And it, it reminds me, and you know, sometimes I'll preach something like this at Christmas, but I, I love this story from uh, the first Christmas, the first couple, Jesus' parents, not the first couple, but it says this, and Joseph uh, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Do you remember that? Because she was found to have a child and he knew that it wasn't his because he hadn't been intimate with her. And he, he, he was like, man, we're going to get divorced. And this was, man, this was like right at the edge of divorce, right? We're, we're thinking about ending this thing. It's getting, this is an ugly scenario. But then it says this in verse 20 of chapter 1 of Matthew. But when he had considered this, so like he had in his mind what he was going to do. In his flesh, I'm divorcing this woman, right? But as he considered this, and, and that word there, if you look it up in the Greek, it means to think, to deliberate, to bring to mind, to ponder. And I just picture Joseph being, because he was a righteous man. And he, he believed in God and he paused. He had what I call a prayerful pause. And he stopped and said, God, I need, to, I need to know what you would want me to do. God, how do you want me to handle this situation? Instead of just acting on his own flesh and doing his own thing, he deliberated and said, God, I, I need your help. And what's really cool is, you guys know the story, right? But when he had considered this, he had this prayerful pause, behold, <laughs> An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and gave Joseph the advice that he needed. And although maybe you won't have an angel, there's a different kind of angel that exists today. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ and this angel is the angel of Jesus, it's Jesus himself, his Holy Spirit, and he lives inside of you. But guess what? We can make decisions and not consult him, can't we? We can just be in the flesh and we have the Spirit, but are we considering the Lord and asking the Holy Spirit to give us the guidance we need in our marriage and in our conflict to change our thinking, to help us come in alignment with Him? And He will, and He can, and He does, and it works, and He works, and we just have to consider Him. Do you see? Have that pause to say, Lord, I want your perspective. And I pray that, you know, I'll close my little section right now, but I, I hope and pray that if, if there's something that tonight I share that would help at all, that the, if you're encountering something in your marriage right now, or you do this week or next week, that you will go to the Lord and you will allow the Holy Spirit to guide your thinking 
and husband and wife, that you would both do that. You would both truthfully pause your hearts and seek the Lord and then come back together and discuss it with him on your minds and with his perspective. Amen? All right. Well, with that, I am delighted to invite um, my mom and dad forward. They're going to lead us off this, this morning. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, I think one of the greatest memories of, uh, really, of, of my life is when five years ago, my parents were celebrating 50 years and they got a, they rented a house in Door County. And all of us kids, grandkids, we all spent two, three nights at a house in Door County together celebrating their 50th, uh, 50 years of marriage. And now they're at 50, now they're at 55. But uh, I am very blessed. I don't know if my mother-in-law or father-in-law are here, but are they 50, Ke- Kelly? Are they at 50 yet? They're at 52. So we have two sets of parents at 55 and 50. That means we are blessed. But anyways, they have had a really wonderful marriage, my parents. So speaking as a child in their home, they have had a fantastic marriage. They have had an unbelievable, they've given me an unbelievable example of not just a great marriage, but a happy marriage. A, a, a marriage where the, a two people really have enjoyed each other and been their best friends for 50 years it's been remarkable. It's probably, you know, there's a lot of great things you guys have done, but as I stand here right now, one of the greatest legacies that you guys have left us is your happy marriage. So, well, now well, we'll go sit down. well done. <laughs> well, well done. Let's give them a hand. Make sure you speak into the mic because this is digitally recorded. So put it close to your mouth if you could. Okay, so I haven't done this. Is this working? Yes. All right. All right. So I know you always name your little Sunday morning thing. So mine is 55 years and still counting. So um, I was born a baby boomer. That's 1946, 1964. Youngest of 11. Grew up Catholic. Grew up fearing the Lord probably more than loving the Lord. Um, My Bible was the Ten Commandments. That's about all I knew about the Bible. And um, I was a rule follower, so that's me. My name is Diane Rosemary Catherine Bertles Caviani. And now after 55 years of marriage, my name is Dee Dee and Ralph. I mean, that's how I, hi, I'm Dee Dee, this is Ralph. You know, or Ralph, I'm Dee Dee, you know, so. That's kind of how it goes. So that gave new meaning to Genesis 2.24 when it says, "Man, because of this, a man um, will leave his father and his mother and unite with his wife, and they will become one flesh. And I I really do believe (laughs) that's kind of how it's worked for us. So we met when I was 16. Um, Our first date was um, Alfred Hitchcock, The Birds. I don't... So it was a really scary movie, and so we held hands, and we snuggled through the whole thing. And I never went out with anybody else after that. So that's how that worked. So now you fast forward to right before we got married, and you know, you know, love is patient, love is kind, that whole thing. I doesn't say necessarily that a happy marriage, love is easy. And so, you know, even though you said we had a great marriage, and we do, it takes a lot of work. Um, we were married in 1967. Divorce never, ever came to mind. I mean, I never thought, well, if this doesn't work, I'll just get a divorce. Um, when I grew up, it wasn't a throwaway society. Um, I remember if our toaster broke, my dad was down in the basement rewiring it. Um, when our shoes wore out, we got new soles and new heels put on. Um, so if something didn't work, the mentality was you had to fix it. So when we had struggles in our marriage, which we did, um, we really worked on fixing them. Um, The one thing, the key for me is I always knew, always, not sometimes as Jay would say, you know, um, not maybe, but I always knew that Ralph would be there for me. I could always go to him. And I still know that today. I mean, if something's going on, he's my rock, so. Anyway, 1 Corinthians says love is 
patient. Oh, I think I told you that, so never mind. Um, I think Ralph, well, I know, Ralph and I always had faith throughout our married life, but um, it really changed for us when it changed from our head to our hearts. Um, unfortunately for us, that didn't happen real early in our marriage. Um, we met two wonderful people when we were about 50, and um, they loved the Lord. They went to a, a Bible-based church and invited us to go, and that just changed everything for us. <clears throat> um, I think we ended up doing 13 years of Bible study with Ed and Linda. Um, in it, Arizona. Yeah, it really made a big difference. Um, so I thank Jesus for putting those two people in our life. So the big question, why has our marriage worked when so many don't? And I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> I read a study that 75% of people who are divorced gave the reason that it was a lack of commitment. They just weren't committed to each other to make it work. Another study stated that religious differences really could make a difference in somebody's marriage or divorce. Um, when I thought about all this, I think for me the answer is sanctification. Um, Ralph and I, you know, we matured together at 16, both physically and spiritually, but just the idea that once we both believed and grew maturity in Christ. That was the answer for us. Um, we've grew together. We both have a deep conviction that the power of the Holy Spirit is in our lives. Thank you, Cutie. Our nicknames are She's Cutie and I'm Fruity. So. I got the better name. Don't go away. Stay here. Well, I've been thinking about tonight for so, for some time and got on my word document and it, I had a difficult time identifying what specific traits contributed to our marital success and a little bit of background Didi comes from a family of 11 there were 10 girls and one boy <laughs> the boy was born number 10 and Didi was born number 11 and and, and God had a plan for Didi to marry me, and I thank God for that. I came from a loving, dysfunctional family. My parents divorced when I was five. Um, my mother remarried three times. She was a loving um, person who had some serious mental health, characterological issues, even up until two weeks before she passed away, unfortunately. And Didi was always leery about ever marrying me because of my mother. Uh, anyway, <laughs> her last marriage lasted six months, and I said, what, what happened with, with Jerry? And, and she said, well, he married me for my money. I said, you have no money. She says, I've got good credit. That's why he married me. <laughs> anyway, I had a little bit of a background. We both raised in Catholic grade school, Catholic high, all boys Catholic, uh, high school, all girls Catholic high school, met in a play called Annie Get Your Gun in 1963. Uh, 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 and, uh, and that's when we uh, went to the, the Birds movie shortly thereafter. And uh, um, we attended, uh, af after we attended Catholic church before we were married, after we were married, and uh, it was routine. Uh, we believed in a loving God, but we were not reading his word, and we were going through the motions and routine of going to church on Sunday, doing some volunteer work with high school teens and leading some Catholic church caregiver teams. As Dee Dee referred to meeting Ed and Linda Carpenter in Arizona, that changed everything for us in terms of our faith walk. And then Jay became, uh, Jay and Kelly became a believer in 1996, and he also encouraged us to take a look at a Bible-based church. Now, being devout Catholics, whether we were really devout is a big question, but we, we couldn't go to a, a Bible-based church and not go to a Catholic church. So we go to the Catholic church on a Saturday night and go to the Bible-based church on a Sunday morning. And because we're going to go to hell if we don't go to the Catholic church on Saturday night, right? I mean, that's, that's in the, the church law. Well, my brother, my older brother, Fred, was a Capuchin Franciscan priest for a number of years 
got a dispensation from the Pope, and uh, became a psychologist, got married. He's still very active in the Catholic Church. And he finally said, God doesn't care where you go to church. It's where you can grow in your faith. So as a devout Catholic, he gave us permission uh, back around the year 2000 to start going to Bible-based churches and not feeling guilty because we weren't going to our Catholic church. So that really changed a lot of things. Now, in reflecting on our marital history, what stands out the most uh, in, in many ways? We did so many things together. We, we golfed together. We bowled together, played tennis, racquetball, bridge, cribbage, sheep's head, uh, running, enjoying dining at favorite restaurants, and, uh, and, and helping and loving each other. Uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Um, God in his word and be God in his word and being a part of a Bible-based church like crossing community church is really important to us and we look forward to our Bible studies and getting together and and really being a part of of the church family um, we are both very thankful for being blessed better than we deserve from our Heavenly Father and we look forward to our future years as we look for ways to continue to be a loving blessing to one another. Now, two hours ago, I came up with my summary as to why our marriage worked, and I didn't share it with Dee Dee. <laughs> Bottom line, Dee Dee was and is the wonderful family counselor who was able to keep our life balanced because I was a workaholic as well as a marathon running addict. Even today, Dee Dee is the mentor for most of our family, including the grandkids who almost call her daily. And I thank Jesus for giving me, Dee Dee, uh, to me and our family. Amen. Amen. Well done. Well done. You know, I, I want to just take a moment to highlight when I hear something. Nate, my dad covered it, and I'm glad that he mentioned it. But I want to encourage you guys to stretch yourselves in finding things that you can enjoy together. Uh, I'm so thankful that when Kelly and I met, you know, she, she had never downhill skied, she had never water skied, she had never played tennis, she had never played golf, and she does all those things. Now, now she doesn't like the downhill skiing so much, and we don't water ski anymore, we're getting old. But we golf together still to this day. We've, you know, when, when we don't play tennis much anymore, but we will and do and have, and we hike together, and uh, sh sh she's been a lot of fun, and I think we had that example from you, Mom and Dad. You guys have always had fun together and made that a priority in your family to do family fun. We always had family fun. We did activities together, and you guys always had fun together, and it might take a little work, but and you might have to be willing, like, to try stuff that you don't think you'd like or, you know, try something new. But I think it's important that as you get old that you have, like you look forward to retiring together, or growing old together, and having fun together. So be willing to try some new things. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Uh, who did I have next? I think it was Rich, right? So come on forward, you guys, and um, praise the Lord. We're looking forward to learning from you. How many years married now? It'll be 49. And 49. Well, congratulations. Let's give them a hand. Thank you. Thank you. So, we're coming at this, uh, we're coming at this marriage thing from uh, a passage in Ecclesiastes 4.12. Uh, pastor, once I was a uh, born again Christian, he told me this of this passage, and he said, "Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves, but a cord of three strands is not quickly broken." And it has to do with uh, a Christ-centered relationship and the Holy Spirit being wound in to everything that you do. And I uh, believe it, for me, it was not an easy thing because I didn't know how to be a Christian husband and a father. I had to learn that because it was not modeled for me. But I want, uh, I want to give this to my wife. To, she's going to share a little bit about what 
she thought our marriage was like. In 19, we were married in August 18th of 1973. But I didn't become a born again Christian till February of 1983. So we were married, you said 10 months. I was married 10 years before we came to Christ. Although we were raised, both of us in a, in a God fearing, well, we were raised in a, mainstream yeah, mainstream denomination church. So we had a God awareness, but like Ralph and Dee Dee said that he had it up here for a while, but it takes, what, 19 inches to transfer it to your heart and to really apply it? So I'm going to let my wife share with you a little bit about what she thought our marriage was like in the first 10 years. Um, I got married very young. I was only 19. I had just turned 19. Um, but, um, I mean, we, we got married in the church and we took our vows seriously and so we attended church faithfully. I mean, that was a big part of our marriage. Um, it probably helped that we waited three years, the Lord waited three years to bless us with children because we really didn't have a clue of what we were doing. We thought we did, but I mean, we really didn't. We kinda, we worked, we made money and we spent it. <laughs> But um, we had two girls, one in 1976 and one in 1978, and they don't remember life without Jesus. You know, they, they, they were young. They were five and seven when we came to know the Lord personally. And um, there were people in my life that came along in those 10 years. I had a sister-in-law that um, would pick me up and drive me to Elmbrook, and we'd go to a woman's Bible study she thought it was important that I knew who Jesus was. And I, I learned about him, but not the relationship, the personal relationship, which was, I was missing. And then we moved, and in 1981, a neighbor invited me to a woman's Bible study, and I faithfully went to that, and I learned more about Jesus. And then that same year, another neighbor invited our children to Awana. I don't know if you are familiar with Awana, but it's, um, they, they learn the books of the Bible, they memorize scripture, and we'd take them to my parents, and my dad would get the, the, the recorder out and record them saying the books of the Bible, because he thought that was so great. But they pictured, you know, I guess just because it was in our head, you know, more, more that than living for him on a daily basis. So that's, I mean, life was good. We thought we were, you know, we were doing good. <laughs> well, again, we didn't have a whole lot of deep communication going on. And that's something I had to learn to take responsibility in. And uh, so she thought things were going along smoothly, well, I was contemplating walking away from it at all. I was contemplating just getting out of this marriage, and this is like 10 years into this. And uh, with God working in all things, I had a, an injury at the job I was working, and uh, I wound up going on vacation with my grandfather for a while. We took a trip to Virginia to see some relatives that I had never even met before. And uh, through that whole trip, I contemplated, do I want to leave or how should I do this? But like Ellen said, we were married in the church and because of this head knowledge, I knew that the vows I made weren't just to the people that were in the church. I was made these vows before God as well. And I had a long time Christian friend of mine since like first grade. And uh, he, uh, he told us of a, well, every time that I spent any time with him, we would go to his church and his was a Bible believing church. So I heard the gospel given many times. I heard altar calls. So I knew how to do this. I just thought because of where, how I was raised. It was just a different way. We still believed we were still Christians. But 
in this trip I took with my grandfather, when I got back, I actually, in the family room of my home, I got down on my hands and knees, and I asked God, I said, God, if you're real, if you're real, please come into my life and save me and save my marriage. And lo and behold, he did, and uh, it felt like a whole burden of stuff was lifted off of me, and I felt like a light as a feather, and I wanted to share this with everybody. And I did stumble through sharing it with a few friends of mine. And uh, this was in February of 83. Well, this friend, this longtime friend of mine, sent us to a Bible-believing church because the church we were attending was not, I would say, Bible-based and Bible-believing. And so we started attending this church, and this pastor friend that I got to know there, Within a few months of going to that church, he started a two-day seminar. It was called Design for Successful Living. Just basically using uh, principles and instruction from God's word on how to be successful. What does it mean to be a successful person, a successful partner, and a successful parent? And it was just taken through scripture and God's word you know, in Ephesians 2.10, it says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Well, if he prepared in advance for us to do these, what are these works that I'm supposed to be doing? Because now I'm a new Christian, and I, wanna, and I was a sponge, because I wanted to soak up as much of God's word as I could and figure out how to apply it in my life. And so uh, I wanted to figure out what God had intended for me to do. And some of it has to do with just trial and error. I knew I needed to get involved in some kind of ministry going on. I didn't know what. So the need at the church at the time was in what? Four, four and five-year-olds. <laughs> so I, I was with four and five-year-old children with my wife. But... Yeah, but in the meantime, another charismatic couple came into our church and decided he was going to start a junior high ministry, and he came up to us and he says, are you happy where you're at? <laughs> and we go, why, what do you got in mind? He says, well, this junior high ministry that we're going to get together and, and form, it's going to be an outreach. And it definitely was because we wound up running close to 200 junior hires between guys and girls. And, but we ran six, six through eighth graders. But we, we had 200 kids at the time. And so there was a bunch of different leaders that we got involved in this. It was an AWANA program. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it stands for Approved Workmen Are Not Ashamed. So that's where you wind up memorizing and learning scripture. And I thought, this is great because for these kids, like you said, God's word will not go away, will not go away void. So if we can get kids to memorize scripture, even if you gotta bribe them sometimes, it can't be bad. And so we got involved in that ministry and I was in, we were in that ministry for 15 years with junior hires. But I needed to learn how to love my wife. And Pastor Jay was sharing about from Ephesians 5, but in 525 it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. And I went, boy, that's a great responsibility. How do I love my wife? How do I learn to love my wife? as Christ loved the church, sacrificially. And how do I put her needs above mine? And to, that how do I help her become the best that she can be? And so I just needed to take some of God's word and apply it and start to 
put it into our lives and we would pray together. Now this is something that I didn't see modeled at home. So I needed to sit down with my wife and pray with her. And we would pray together for things that were upcoming, pray for our children. And uh, you started to put this one by one into practice into our life. And then I needed to learn how to be a good parent. Well, our children were seven and five at the time, and I needed to learn how to transfer truth to my children in love. Because, and I needed to learn how to discipline them properly because what, I was, what was modeled at home was you sometimes discipline in anger and you just take it out on, on your child out of anger. Well, I learned that you needed discipline and love. And I needed to learn how to do that, how to communicate truth to my child in a loving way. And even though I had to do corporal punishment on the child at times, how to do that lovingly. And, uh, and it was just all a trial and error met method for us for a long time. But, you know, throughout the years, God used it to uh, ground us in his word. And, uh, and Pastor Jay's been preaching this uh, a long time in the pulpit since I've been coming here. And in James chapter 1, in verse 22, it says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. So we had to learn to do what God's word says as we read it. How do we apply this to our lives and how do we make it a goal? Do you have anything to add? And so uh, if, I could, if I could leave with anything for a successful marriage, it has to do with just having a God-centered marriage. It's, it's having him involved in everything you do and all your decisions. Now, as many of you know, I, I do music up here. I'd rather be holding the guitar and singing to you right now than talking, but, but I also do this on the outside. I, uh, and so I don't, I do, I don't always do Christian music. I do some other music too, but to me it's a way of ministering to people even though it's not always a Christian song. I get to meet a lot of different musicians and friends. In other words, and that's how I got to know no, John Newman, who, who's led worship here many a time, was through an open mic. And uh, so I just, I was able to get to know other musicians. And uh, they actually, I'm not afraid to share my faith, especially if it comes up and they ask me about it, if they'll, and I, I had an opportunity one time where we were, uh, a, a guy came up to me. We went to a, a party of his brother. His brother had a 50th birthday party. And so he said, he came, pulls me off to the side and he says, you're the closest thing to a reverend I know. <laughs> and I looked at him, I go, what? He said, would you mind praying tonight for these festivities? And I go, I'd consider that an honor. You know, that'd be great. <laughs> so it's just getting to know some of these people and just being able to share with them. You got to get to know people and become friends with them so that they can trust you a little bit so that if you can, if, when it comes time to share your faith, they know you where you're coming from. And so... I just want to thank you and, and pray that you can keep your marriages strong. Well done. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Ellen. Beautiful. I love having God at the center of your marriage, and it's clear that that has made a big difference in your lives. So next up is Ken. And, and his lovely wife, Barb, is next to him. I don't know if she's sharing as well, but... Welcome, Ken. Ken's one of our elders, a longtime friend of mine, a uh, man I respect in the Lord, and I look forward to what you have to share with us tonight, Ken. Really, uh, 
really a great night of uh, testimony yeah. um, with some powerful truths. Um, and so uh, I'm going to begin by adding some more powerful truths. In this was sent to me uh, about a week ago from my son-in-law. And this is shocking. Uh, in 1932, a wife held up a bulletproof piece of glass as her husband shot his gun into it. And the comment that may, was made there is you just can't find good wives like that anymore. So that's really shocking, isn't it? <laughs> My statement or segment is the power of culture and marriage. Barbara and I came out of a culture with an attitude, a lifestyle, married till death do us part. Our parents, an interesting uh, deity, uh, my mom came out of a family of uh, 10 siblings with um, 10 sisters and one brother. Um, and then Barbara and I came out of uh, our high school friends with a culture of no divorce. Kind of interesting. Today's culture produces one divorce out of two marriages. And the shame of it is, is this even happens within Christians, within Christian marriages. So the statement which this speaks loudly here is, culture is more powerful than Christian influence. There's a strange, strange creature named the sea squirt. I'm sure you all heard of this. Uh, it starts out as a tadpole, and as it matures, it digests its own brain, becoming a passive straw, usually fastened to a rock, and waving in the power of the current around it. I don't know if you get this picture. It changes from having a vibrant life to becoming a passive, spineless, and thoughtless one. Question. I would assume all marriages start out with a vibrancy. Then why allow the current of culture to drive us down to destruction? Doesn't the Lord in his truth make us free and guide us into all abundance? After all, doesn't Satan with his scheming, deceitful tactics rule the culture that we live in? It's very obvious. So, are we spineless, passive victims without wisdom as Christians? If your marriage even has a hint of being in trouble, I say, change your culture. How? Look at the culture of 70 years ago. Although they didn't see it that way, they operated under more kingdom principles. The husband was the sole provider, protector of his family. He found great identity and worth in life. His wife found great value and peace, raising her family and caring for the home. Another thought would be reduce the influence of materialism. They existed with the need of only one car, for example, a very simple life. 
family is that important. Then there's the truth that there are roles or positions of authority while all are equal. Now where does this come from? Look at this. Look at the Godhead. The Son, under the authority of the Father, and the Holy Spirit serves them both. That's an order that God set in the heavens in regard to his own family. And so the human family, God's design is therefore clear. In 1 Corinthians 11, 13, it says this. Now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. Then Paul describes head coverings. A wife had a wife's head covering represents her dependency on her husband. The husband's uncovered head, that symbolizes his dependency on Christ. So the wife is really triple blessed with these resources. She is under the protection and support and provision of her husband, then of Christ, and according to verse 10, it even says the angels contribute. What a beautiful picture. In close, I close with this testimony. Barbara and I have been um, together now near 60 years. That is all a interesting history of life together. We started as rebellious teens. We were married and after two children and with the struggles of life and the selfishness of sin, we came to Jesus in our mid-twenties. And with his help, and guidance matured in our marriage. We can look back and we have so many wonderful stories. Barbara has some that I don't appreciate as much as she does. <laughs> of most recent, and you think about this as you age together, tremendous health issues we both, though over different situations, uh, near, entered into near death. But what a blessing to be faithful mates together. Really great. Boy, 60 years of knowing and being with one person. I love her and I know she sometimes loves me. <laughs> We too, like Ralph and Dee Dee, enjoy each other, whether it be traveling or our next um, property to own or whatever it ends up to be. Now it's properties to sell. But we enjoy playing the game of Rummy Cube and Dummy Rummy, and we'll do it almost nightly. And uh, sometimes I win too. So. <laughs> So as our life moves into the wonderful years of elders, um, we have the confidence of support to one another and still the promise of some fruit fruitfulness. And um, so I, I think that's a little bit of a segment that um, Maybe it can be useful to uh, someone tonight. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. All right, we're doing pretty good.
good. Our plan was to go from 6.30 to 8, and we're, we're, we're right in there. You know, I, I was actually counseling, I don't know if I have my mic on. I was counseling someone uh, a little while back, and, and one of the things that I think, I don't know, kind of came to me in, in the counseling session with them, and then it's really stuck with me since. I think it's kind of simple. Um, what is what you're doing in your life as it relates to your marriage? Are you honoring God and honoring your spouse? I think that a lot of marriage difficulty or problems come from not doing one of those. So I, I would just ask you to ask yourself, is my behavior, is what I'm doing, honoring God, that's first. And if you honor him, <laughs> what will go with it is honoring your spouse as well. But I think it's good to ask that question as well. Is what I'm doing honoring God and honoring my spouse? And if it's not, then don't do it anymore. And that would save a lot of problems in marriage, amen? So really, I ask you, you know, tonight, to, to take that with you, to think about that. Is what I'm doing honoring God? And is what I'm doing honoring my spouse? May that bless you and help you. And uh, I have one more thing that I will share, but I'm going to turn it over to my good friend and our executive pastor, Russ Heder. I almost said Russ Heater because when I call you on my on my uh, uh, my mobile man. phone, and I say I want to call. They say calling Russ Heater. That's like, it's not Russ Heater. It's Russ Header. I want to tell them and have them fix that. Siri needs to do something about. Yeah, that. but anyways, Russ, looking forward to hearing from you and your story with Amy tonight. Thanks. Yeah, and it's funny. My uh, when I do the same thing, I call my mom and says and her name's Cindy, but for some reason Siri calls her Sandy. Oh really? So it's like Sandy Heater. That's <laughs> definitely not her name. So. Um, I'm going to be fairly brief tonight, but I, I'm going to end what I'm talking about with more of a call to action, and then I'll, I'll toss it back to you, Pastor Jay. But I want to kind of recap uh, some of what we've heard tonight. So, Pastor Jay, you opened uh, with overcoming conflict and uh, taking a prayerful pause when conflict arises in your marriage. Ralph and Dee, uh, first of all, Ralph, if you ever want to play Sheep's Head, I, I love Sheep's Head. I'm your guy. Uh, do you? Um, anybody else? Because we're, we'll get a club going. Uh, but you guys covered uh, doing things together and being together as a, as a big part of what's uh, been a big part of your 55 years. How long have you guys been married, Jay? I don't want to put you on the spot. One Kelly, how long have you been married? Seven. <laughs> 27, 55. I think I heard 47 from Rich. 49. 49. And then 60. 57. I, I heard 60 because we've been together for 60. Yeah. All right, I think that might actually, you know what? Put that in your notes. Put that in your notes, because that's really important. <laughs> Meet each other before you get married. That's a really important call out, Ken. You should have said that up here. Man, I'm glad we caught that before everybody left. <laughs> uh, Rich and Ellen talked about having a Christ-centered marriage, learning how to love your spouse. And then Ken talking about the power of culture in marriage, and we must look past the current culture and focus on changing your culture. F friends, the reason I'm, I'm reiterating some of these things is hopefully you're taking notes. I think the wives probably are, and the men are looking at their wives' notes. <clears throat> but hopefully you're taking notes because the things that we're talking about tonight are they're things that you know. Okay, these aren't, these aren't new concepts to you. But... 55, 47, 57, I mean, these are years and years and years of marriage. And taking the advice of people who have been doing this longer than you is probably a good thing. So make sure you're taking your notes. And then, uh, again, I have a call to action at the end. Uh, so my story, uh, our story, uh, my wife Amy and I, we've been married 19 years yesterday. Uh, so we celebrate 19 years together. Yeah, praise the Lord. And uh, uh, our story is is one of... It's actually, it's kind of an exciting story, and I don't know how much I'm going to share tonight, so I'm going to, I might be a little all over the place. I'm trying to figure out how much I want to share, but we got married, uh, as I think most of you guys did, probably fairly young. Um, I was 21. She was 22 at the time. Uh, we didn't have a long courtship. Uh, in fact, I think I might have been, I was your first boyfriend, yeah? 
She didn't have any other boyfriends before me. I had maybe a relationship or two in high school, which you don't really count into college. That doesn't really count. Uh, but when I met Amy, I, I knew she was the one. Like, I fell in love. Uh, we uh, we dated for, let's see here, our first date was September like 6th of 2002. Right around there, we went to a wedding together. I had a first date, um, go to a wedding, and you get married then right away. Um, but we got we got engaged in in uh, in October of that year. Uh, went to her parents' house, asked for her parents' permission to to marry her. They knew we had been dating for a very brief period of time. Her parents are are very faithful, uh, long lifelong Christ followers. And uh, I remember going to her parents' house and and saying I'd like to marry your daughter. And they gave me permission. They said just take your time. You know when you feel it's the right time to propose, go ahead and do it. And so I immediately left their house and met her over at Elmbrook Church, went on one knee and <laughs> proposed. <laughs> Within 45 minutes, uh, we got engaged. We went back to her parents' house, and I said, hey, guess what? <laughs> We're engaged. <laughs> so uh, we, and then we got married uh, less than a year later. We got married in July. And, uh, you know, when, yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, what we've learned over the course of our marriage is that I wouldn't say we rushed into it because we felt it was right. We both had a strong foundation of faith in our marriage. But we also learned that we didn't, um, we had a lot of things to overcome in our marriage. Uh, my wife is uh, less communicative than I am. I, I tend to be an introvert when I'm at home, uh, but I'm, I'm more of the communicator. She's less of the communicator. This is, if you know my wife, you know, this is how she is. I love her for that. Um, but as time goes on, you start to realize well, I want them to change for me. I don't necessarily want to have to change for them. This back and forth happens. And for us, that happened for a number of years. Communication was always an issue in our marriage. Um, we had two kids. We had Cullen in 2009, Miles in 2013. Uh, when you have kids, your priorities somewhat shift, right? So you go from she's my primary focus, I'm her primary focus, to you can kind of shift uh, somewhat of the responsibility of your relationship onto your kids. You've got your kids in common. Those are things that you really focused on. And so for us, our communications issue just kept compounding itself. And then I started getting promoted at work, and I kept thinking, this is the Lord blessing me. This is the Lord blessing me. I'm moving up in my job, and I'm, I'm doing bigger things. And I started traveling in my job, and communications issue kept compounding itself even further, even further. 2016, uh, I was asked to move to Kansas uh, to take a role at my company, and uh, after some discussion, we decided to go ahead and do it. So in July of uh, 2016, I started flying back and forth to Kansas every Sunday night, and then I'd fly back Friday night. I'd be home for a day and a half, and then I would do it all over again until we finally moved the family down there in September. And can you guess what happened? <laughs> Communication kept compounding and compounding and compounding, getting worse and worse, to the point where, and then, and then you add in the fact that I worked for the CEO, and so I was working 120 hours a week. I was in the office seven days a week. I was never home, barely saw my family, and uh, I had an air mattress in the basement that I'd sleep on for six hours and go back to work. And it, it really sank in for us at that time uh, how rough things got. Uh, without going too far into detail, um, we had a, it was a, it was probably the hardest point in our marriage. It was it was the hardest point in our marriage, uh, but the Lord was with us the entire time. And so I remember going to a friend of mine who's a pastor in uh, it was Thanksgiving of 2016, and just kind of poured my heart out to him. And I just said, "Listen, I'm you know we're, we're having these struggles. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Clearly, I'm <laughs> working too much." Um, he suggested a conference, uh, and, and I sat on it for probably two or three months before really thinking about, because I'm not a conference guy, like things like this tonight, I'm, a, I'm actually enjoying this, but usually this is not my type of thing. I don't really enjoy sitting and, and learning about how to fix my marriage. It's something that's important, and I'm glad everyone here made a priority out of it, but it's not something that we did, but it became something that we did. And, uh, and so in, in early 2017, I text Amy. She was here in Wisconsin with uh, with our boys, and I was in Kansas. And I said, "We we should we got to do something." And so I suggested we take this. We go to this conference. It was called Marriage Restored. Very small group. You get these big marriage conferences. You get large numbers of people in these conferences, and uh, and you know those are great events. But this was a very focused conference on on trying to fix your marriage. And so we both committed to it. 
we actually flew from Kansas to Wisconsin. My mom flew from Wisconsin to Kansas to watch the boys. And uh, we got there on a Friday night. It was at a hotel in Brookfield. And we spent the weekend learning how to reconnect. And so the conference starts off with everybody in the, there's only eight couples. We were one of eight couples talking about what their issues were. It was actually kind of funny. I don't know if you remember this kind of, I was kind of laughing that night because it, 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 all right, so it wasn't funny, but it was kind of funny. Okay, because they, they went to each couple, and like the first couple was like, you know, well, my husband's cheated on me like six times, which that's not funny, but they get to us, and it's the same story for almost everybody. There was a drug and alcohol issue, but it was primarily infidelity, and then they get to Amy, and I say, what's your issue? And we're like, oh, we just don't communicate very well. <laughs> they're like, is that it? Um, but the whole point of the weekend is breaking down the barriers of communication in your marriage. And so... Uh, and so that's what we did. Uh, you spend the weekend in little groups uh, learning together for an hour or two. They teach you a lesson. They go through a, uh, some, some part of your marriage. They talk about it. And then at the end of the, the second hour, they send one spouse back to their hotel room. One stays in the room. And then you write a letter to each other. And <laughs> I remember thinking, like, this is the worst thing on the face of the earth. Like, this is so bad. Uh, I remember telling Amy, like, this, I hate this. I absolutely hate this. I'm not going to, we're not going to stick around. But we stuck it out. Uh, and so you write a letter to each other, and then you go back to the room. You hand it to the person. They read it. You have a good cry. And then, uh, and then you're, you know, you go back and you do more sessions and all that stuff. So the weekend's going as you can expect. Uh, they have you do a date night. Uh, on Saturday afternoon, you go, we went and got coffee together and just kind of caught up. And then Sunday, and then they have like a, oh, I'll leave that alone. There's, there's another part of it, which was, it was kind of neat. It was like a worship night, um, which, was, which was fun. But then Sunday, it's a marathon session because they know you're leaving at noon. And this is like the last opportunity to, to impact you. And so they have you in this session, and then you have four, I think it was like four hours, something like that, three or four hours. I mean, it was a long time where one spouse goes to the room, you sit there, and then you, you write a letter to each other. But this is a letter that's like, eight to ten pages. I mean, it's, you're pouring your heart out at this point. And it's like the, the apex of this entire weekend. And then they drop a bomb on you as you're about to go back to the room. They say, all right, folks, here's the change. You're no longer handing your letter to, the, to your spouse. You're going to read it to them. Think about that. Have you ever written a letter to somebody or a nasty email and you're like, all right, I'm good. You hit send and you're done. Imagine having to read that out loud to that person. That will, that will break you. And so here's my homework for you leaving this event, my challenge to you before I hand it back to you, Pastor Jay, is I want you to spend some time thinking about and, and the recap that I gave, and you'll give a recap at the end, but think about the notes that you've taken tonight. Think about what you can take. Maybe it's one little nugget. Maybe it's a whole sheet of paper of nuggets. But think about what you've learned in this event tonight. Really process it. And I want you to write, write a letter to your spouse doesn't have to be eight to ten pages. It can be a page. It can be a half page. It can be a note card. Don't do an email. Handwrite this letter, okay? And I want you to spend a half hour this weekend and, and read it to your spouse. And maybe it's a love letter. Maybe it's how much you love them and what you appreciate about them and what you adore about them. Maybe it's something that you've been struggling with and you want their help with it. Maybe it's something that you've been reading and studying in the Word and you just want to share that with them. But spend some time, write that letter, sit down with them, and intentionally discuss it. That's number one. And that's the most important thing that I'm going to talk about here. The second thing, and as I think about our marriage and what's really kept, our, what's really, I mean, our marriage is now probably the best it's ever been. I, and praise the Lord for this. I mean, that marriage conference, after breaking me and breaking my wife, um, man, we, we've got, we got a tremendous marriage. I love my wife more than, more than anything on the face of this earth. Uh, and one of the things that's really made us strong is we do, a, we do a daily devotion together. We read the Bible, whether it's, and this is the other challenge for you. If you don't currently do this, find a devotional, talk to Pastor Jay. I'm sure he's got some options. I've got some ideas. Uh, any one of our elders, we'd love to talk about it. But find something that you can read together. It doesn't have to be an hour. It can be 5, 10, 15 minutes. But find something that you can read as a married couple. If you want to do one as a family, that's extra credit. But do something as a married couple together daily. If you miss a day, pick it up the next day. But do it together. Incredibly important. 
And so the only other thing I got for you, and then Pastor, I'll hand it back to you, is I just want to read Ecclesiastes. Um, I know we're all kind of doing scripture here. I just got to find where I have it bookmarked. Um, Ecclesiastes 9, uh, verse 9. This is really for the men, but, uh, and, and you guys hear me talk about men and your importance in, in, the, in the marital unit and really in your family's lives. I have a real passion for this. Enjoy life with the woman who you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting life. Love your wives. Husbands, love your wives. Be men. Step up and lead your families. If you do these things, I can't guarantee you're going to have a perfect marriage, but you're going to have a Christ-centered marriage, one that's focused on him. And if it's focused on him, everything else kind of falls into place. Amen? So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, so I just have a few things, because I talked to my wife, and um, she was willing to correspond, and we talked about things, but she wasn't really wanting to get up in front and talk. I, it would have been cool, um, but, but that's, that's where we're at. <laughs> so, <clears throat> I, you know, some of this I got to kind of like fill in the blank, but I feel like, like early on in our marriage, like, you know, if you don't know this, Pastor Jay is not perfect, and obviously I'm human, so we all know that already, but, but I'm not, you know, and I think I've always enjoyed golf, so like when I was, when we were younger, and she played a little bit then, but you know, the kids were young, and I wanted to play golf, and I think sometimes she, you know, maybe resented that. Um, at home, I think, like, I'm, you know, I hear I'm, I'm sharing my ugly wares, you know what I mean? But, like, I'm one who leaves stuff around. I don't pick up real well. Like, it's not, like, I'm not good at that, you know? And and that's terrible, I know. So it's like I feel bad I'm sharing this dirty laundry about myself. But I think at some point, you know, my wife was like, I wish my husband would change this, and then I'll be happy. Now, fortunately, I wasn't, there was a lot of other things I wasn't doing, I guess I'm not trying to compliment myself, but how do I say this? What my wife said about what she wanted to say or what I could maybe kind of help say for her is that I didn't have to change for her to be happy, that she could choose to be happy on her own. So I think that's just something to think about. Sometimes we're always waiting for something to happen to be happy but that we can, we can choose to be happy. And uh, it's, you know, really some of the things that maybe troubled her back then, they, she's just, they, they don't bother her anymore. And uh, now it's kind of fun. Some of you know, like, my daughter's become a competitive golfer, and we're like, hey, we're going golfing. Great, go have a good time. You know what I mean? So it's kind of it's been different that way, but she just learned how to, she realized it was a choice to be happy. And um, now I feel kind of bad saying that, like you're just really unhappy, but you have to choose to be happy. <laughs> That's the way maybe that came across, but whatever, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll take it. Um, we, I think, <laughs> how do I speak for you? This is really hard, honey. <laughs> She's really happy. My wife's really happy, if you didn't know. <laughs> how do I say that? Uh, another thing that we talked about is that you know, my parents were really good examples. Like, they, they really, behind the scenes, they might have argued. I probably saw them disagree at times. But they really never, I mean, a couple of times we probably really deserved it and they raised their voices. But, like, I mean, I can't even remember what they were about. So my parents always had good words and well-reasoned. And, you know, my dad was a counselor. So he's like, well, let's talk about this, and he would hear what we would have to say. He would listen to us. And so I had modeled in my home growing up good communication and uh, silent treatment, pouting, manipulating, yelling, name-calling, put-downs, criticisms, justifying poor behavior. Those are some things that my wife said that's not good for a marriage. And uh, I'm thankful that that hasn't been a part of our marriage. But I want to 
I want to say I know that that kind of stuff does take place, and can I just say cut it out? Like, don't criticize your spouse. Don't name call. Don't yell at each other. Treat each other with respect. Reason with each other. It's just not, it's not appropriate to put each other down and uh, criticize or to justify poor behavior. Um, Amen? So learning how to communicate functionally, Russ, you, you thought you really, you know, you, you focused on that. And I think for some folks, maybe you need, might need help or counsel or, but, but learn how to talk to each other and listen to each other well-reasoned, amen? Um, the last thing that I wanted to share, and you know, it's kind of like I had a number of things I wanted to share. I don't know if I'm ending on a high note, so Lord, help me to end on a high note, although I'm not there yet. <laughs> Um, what I have found in counseling, okay, I've been a pastor for 13 years, so I've counseled a lot of marriages, and um, it doesn't always go so well. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes, sometimes it's good to have your pastor provide counsel, and, um, but sometimes it's hard, you know, because I'm getting involved in, in your, you know, family issues, in the, you know, and um, sometimes there's things that need to be changed, you know, in, in you or in your marriage. And I may, I may see that after I counsel and I may say, listen, brother, what you're doing here or sister is wrong and that needs to change in order to honor God. I'm kind of direct that way. And uh, sometimes people don't like that so much, you know. But uh, I don't do it out of, uh, I do it with a pastor's heart, you know. Sometimes we get to the truth on something and something needs to change, you know. Uh, so I hope I can do it compassionately. But, but what I really wanted to say is this. <clears throat> the worst thing that can happen in, in a marriage is when people get hopeless. They don't have hope anymore. They've lost hope that it's going to change. And a lot of people get to that point where they've just lost hope. God can change anyone. He can change all of us. I think people in general are pretty forgiving, actually. Husbands and wives of one another. I think they're willing to work with each other and give each other second chances and and work things out. I think most of you that's the desire of most of you to, to work things out. And that's good. It's a good quality. But eventually, when you keep repeating the same problems over and over and over again, one of the spouses begins to lose hope. They're hopeless and they think, I can't trust that this is going to change. I think it's just going to keep happening again and again and again. And I can't, I can't take it anymore. And then they get to the point where they, they want a divorce and once they get separated, <clears throat> they don't want to go back because they, they see themselves just going back into this prison of, a, of hopelessness that won't get fixed. So we don't want to get to that point where we're hopeless. <clears throat> so what, what gives hope? God gives hope. <laughs> what gives hope? So... If you think you're in a marriage where, where maybe your wife or your husband is hopeless, what's really needed is genuine repentance. Genuine repentance is to change one's mind for the better, to heartily amend, and listen to this, and it's, it's a big word, but to heartily amend with abhorrence one's past sins. One of the things that I hear is that my husband or wife won't even really acknowledge that what they did was wrong. And if, you, if you're not willing to acknowledge that what you did is wrong, guess what it means? You're likely to repeat it again, right? So what's really needed to give hope where someone's hopeless is to really acknowledge with sincerity, I have messed up. What I have done is wrong. It's wrong before you. It's wrong before God. It's not acceptable, and I'm not going to do it again. 
And I mean it with God's help. And I'm willing to get counsel and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I mean it. I want to change. I'm willing to turn from my old way and I'm willing to take a new way. Lord, help me. And you mean it from the bottom of your heart. You repent and turn from your sin and you turn towards God. And guess what? If that's real, guess what that'll bring? Hope. Where there was hopelessness. And if you have hope, then your marriage has a chance, right? God brings that hope. Turning to God brings that hope. May, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I want to stop and pray, and we might not exactly close with this, but I just want to stop and pray with you right now for anyone who really needs that repentant change. Repentance brings joy. When you finally acknowledge the depth of your sin and you're just willing to admit it, the devil has to flee from the light. He hates the light. And when you repent and you confess your sin and you bring that into the light, the devil flees and it begins to set you free. And it begins to live for God. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that any man or woman in here who really needs to acknowledge their sin with sincerity and to turn from their ways and to turn towards you, God, that they would have the humility to confess and to come into the light. And Father, that your Holy Spirit would work to, to provide that change that you can bring. God, you are big enough. You created the heavens, the earth, you created us. You can change anything and anyone. And God, I pray that we would welcome that change, that we would partner with you in the change that we need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And you know what we really need to, to like, in, as this goes on? I, I mentioned that I want to close with, with joy. And maybe it happens now, but I pray that it happens in the weeks to come is that we have some testimonies from this night where people are changing for the glory of God and where marriages are turning around, amen? amen. That would bring joy to you and to our church. Hey, hey, we're married. We might as well have a good one, right? Man, it's, a, it's, it's no fun to be in a crummy marriage. Let's make our marriages good ones and enjoy them and have fun, amen? amen. All right. Um, does anybody have a word? Does anybody have something they want to share? Just raise your hand and let me know. Go ahead. Amen. Yeah, pray for one another. <clears throat> one encouragement, I think in the letters that you guys write, if you choose to write them, I mean, listen, you do what you want. You guys are adults. But I, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is there'd be nothing more that your spouse would love to hear, and I think that God would love to hear, where you would acknowledge where you've gone wrong and where you need to change, and that, and that, you would bestow blessings on your spouse in your letter and you would let them know where you see you want to change and that your letter wouldn't be about what they're doing wrong. And I think if, you know, now listen, some, some of y'all <laughs> are doing stuff wrong, but you know what would be really cool? Is if, if you let the Lord tell you that 
and then you told your spouse what you're doing wrong. And I'll tell you what, they would love to hear what you're, they would love to hear you acknowledge what you're doing wrong. <laughs> no, but it would be a blessing. It really would. It would be a blessing to each other that you praise them and you, you, you really look deep inside of you on what you want to change for the glory of God and for your marriage. Amen? I think you guys would be encouraged by that experience. Anybody else? Thank you, Michelle. Pray for one another. Anyone else have a word they want to share? I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Yes. Nancy. Two things, all right. Yes. Right? Like when I have done something that has really frustrated him and mm-hmm. he is acknowledging I'm really frustrated, I'm like, you're right. I was late and I'm unprepared and it's not fair to you. Amen. And, and so we have admitted Humility. the other person's right. And the, and the interesting thing is the more you do it, the walls of resistance yeah. for that come down. Beautiful. Yeah. Like, like it just it makes it less deep and and less frequent and and so but we do it with even small things and big things. The yeah. other thing that Chris started and I give him absolute full complete credit on this. I don't know where he learned it. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> That is so you guys right there. That is so you guys. Is he somewhere started saying thank you for a lot of the little things. Hmm. Like thank you for grocery shopping or thank hmm. you thank you for doing the dishes. Thank you for gardening. Thank you for this. And and it was nothing that we took as a premarital class to do that. Hmm. That's powerful. Well, I'm not working as much as he is, but he mm. works long days and he, he does work hard at his job. And mm-hmm. so then I'd be like, well, thanks for working hard today. Yeah. Thanks for driving far today. And, and so we just started saying thank mm-hmm. you for a lot mm. of the common, everyday little things. Mm. We don't do it every day, but that makes a huge difference too. Yeah. Like putting the positive into the marriage because we don't mm. always yeah. So for those who are still listening <laughs> or watch this later who didn't hear any of that, uh, if, if your spouse were to say to you or say, hey, you know what, what you really did there wasn't good, and you just say, you know what, you're right. You're right. I need to do better there. Instead of spending all the energy defending yourself, you know, just agree, and, and, and it, it, that's a blessing. And then she was talking, this is Chris and Nancy, dear are, we're talking about how they just started encouraging each other for regular normal things like thank you for doing the dishes thank you for going grocery shopping and they started it you can have like a circle and this is what a lot of people have in their marriages is a circle of criticism so one criticizes one and the other person just criticizes back and you have like this negative cycle or you can create a positive cycle and you encourage one another, the other person encourages you, and now you have like a positive wheel of encouragement in your home. What a blessing that would be. So both of those are really good words. Michelle talked about, I think I already mentioned on the mic, but praying for your spouse, which is great. Anyone else have something they want to share? Ken. Hey, I can't remember the, the movie um, Love Dare or something. Yeah, like Love Dare. Yeah. Over it. Can't see over the wall. And I think what that movie pointed out is, I think it was like a 50-day challenge mm. or whatever it was, but it was a, a step-by-step. Mm-hmm. And so I think I would encourage all of what was said tonight to take it to heart, but understand it's a work in process. 
Yeah. And the goal is yeah. beautiful. Put the goal of finding favor mm -hmm. in your marriage before yeah. God. Yeah. The goal of a beautiful testimony. Mm. Put that out, mm. but think of it as a step by step. Mm -hmm. I think that can be really encouraging. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Yes, Tim. Um, you kind of just encourage everybody that all the things that you heard here today are just fantastic. And I think it really needs to building a strong marriage that can last through um, whatever life will throw at you. Mm -hmm. And um, what I, you know, I guess I would add to it, you know, just really focusing on it. I think Ken did a great job of explaining this. Um, you know, having number one, your relationship with God, um, both you individually and then together as well, as a lot of you guys mentioned, um, you know, making that, that triangle, um, being each other's best friend mm -hmm. uh, is, is what's key. And there's a lot of these things really go into that. And um, one of the things that I, I think really helps is learning to speak their language. Let's talk about communication. Mm -hmm. All right, I do have one last thing, and then we're going to close it. We're almost at 8 o'clock, but <clears throat> it, I think it's, it's worth saying is that, I, I, you know how it says that God made a helper for Adam? You guys remember that? I think in most women, okay, there's this natural desire to want to support her husband. It's like part of God's creation. So God, like woman actually wants to help support um, their husband. I would say that even sexually, that that can be true as well. And when, so here's what I want to say to you, is that men, if your wife is not wanting to help you uh, in all those ways, if it's not going right, you got to ask yourself why that might be. Because I just said to you, if you heard what I said, it's kind of natural for women to want to help their husband. So when they don't want to help their husband, something's wrong. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and usually what I've found is if I'm treating my wife the way she deserves to be treated, the natural part of the way God made her, she wants to help me. But if I'm not treating her the way that I should, it creates a rub and it makes it harder for her to be who God created her to be for me. So really what I'm trying to say is when your wife's not responding to you the way that you'd like, a lot of times, man, it's something that you gotta, instead of looking at her, you gotta look at yourself and say, what do I need to do in order to cherish my wife? Because if I cherish her, she will naturally, the way God created her, want to respond to me. All right. May God help you in one of those ways. Help me in one of those ways. Um, it's a journey. We need the Lord all the way through. Amen? So, Lord God, I thank you for all the people that have shared, and I thank you for your word, and I thank you for the examples of experience tonight. And, Lord, I pray that 
that you would not allow this to return void, but that indeed, God, each of us would be able to take something and truly apply it, God, and that we could have marriages that shine the light of Jesus to this world. And Lord, that we could enjoy them as well, that our marriages would be a blessing to us and to the world around us. So Lord, please help each person now in this last prayer. Help each of us to know, God, what you would have us apply to what we, from what we've learned today and, uh, and give us the strength to follow through, God, on it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you all. Thank you for coming out.